So we're gonna light our BGS candle, okay? I should have an actual candle for BGS. Maybe I just put a picture of Todd. Hold on, I'm gonna print out a picture of Todd. We're gonna tape it to this. This is gonna be our Todd handle, a uh, Todd candle. I kind of hope one day that he pops into one of these streams or videos and it's just like, what on earth did I do in my career? to cause crazy people to do stuff like this. He's like, I just make video games. Why Why do they do this? Now it's a Todd candle. <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay, okay. Now we can discuss Todd and his many antics, okay? So here's the deal, yo. Here's the deal, yo, with, with Mr. Todd. There's a discussion that's ongoing within the BGS community right now that is hotly debated. And that is whether, like what the what the real issue is with BGS. Because everybody agrees that there's something off. There's something wrong that needs addressing. Starfield didn't live up to expectations. A lot of people found it disappointing, especially the more they played. Fallout 4 was sort of a mixed bag. Fallout 76, we don't even need to really discuss in much detail. Everybody already knows all the problems there. So something's wrong with BGS. And a lot of people are like, it's not the creation engine. It's the writing. It's not the technology it's actually the game designers that are stuck in days of old or other people are like it's not any of that it is just the creation engine if they just had better technology they would do uh, much better stuff but i think it's it's sort of a mixed bag it's tough to to pin down i think it's a mixture of all of them so i think what we could do is we could kind of split this up into like it's the creation engine as one kind of option it's the writers, retiers, or we could say it's the design. These are probably the three most common frustrations and complaints people have with, with BGS games. I mean, the, the first point with the creation engine is that I don't think anybody's going to argue that it's outdated. Like you look at anything that, that Starfield does or anything that Fallout 4 did or Fallout 76 did, and it is inferior to the competition. I think that that holds it back. I, and I mean, even other things like the fact that it has a lot of like legacy code that hasn't been stripped out really holds it back too. We talked about this in the video I did on how modders have said that the floating point problem can't be easily enough fixed within Starfield to get rid of like the loading screen issue or the constant little fishbowl environments instead of a whole open universe or anything. And it's basically just because my understanding, and I mean, I'm sure people are going to correct me when I get some of this wrong, but my understanding with a lot of this is that how a lot of this works is that in the creation engine, what happens is that there's sort of a starting point X. Uh, if you imagine this whole frame or canvas as like a playable map, right? So there's X, which is where the player starts. It's the world instance. It's the zero comma zero. It's where everything begins, right? And then as you travel out from this, there's different levels of detail and fidelity that can be reached in terms of like placing objects, in terms of simulating stuff, especially within Starfield. And so the farther away from X that you get, the less accurately it can pinpoint simulated locations, the less uh, accurately it can track player movements things like that. It just starts to break down because it's all based on this and they use floats and things to store that data and communicate it back to other things that the engine is doing. And there have been ways that other studios have fixed this. The problem with Starfield is that this X is pretty much always your ship. So when you land on a planet, whether it's for uh, like New Atlantis or if it's on a planet you're just randomly exploring, this X point is where you land. And then everything spawns away from that and kind of cycles away from that as it procedurally generates. In other games though, what they do is they either go to like 64 bit stuff and they they solve the floating point problem in just by brute forcing it with more data, which is basically what they did with Star Citizen where they can have an entire galaxy and have that fully simulated and never have this issue. Other studios, my understanding is that like uh, the way Ubisoft does this is that the player character is always basically this point. So they're able to get around it that way. It's very complicated. There's a lot of math involved with it. But one of the ways that this was represented was with, uh, it was like the Minecraft, like far away lands. Because Minecraft obviously is very, very heavily simulated and uh, everything is procedural. 
And what would basically happen is when you got too far away from that X point, simulations and procedural algorithms and stuff would just start to break. It just wouldn't work right. So you'd end up reaching these, what players ended up calling like the far lands, which were just really bizarre formations that didn't make sense. They didn't really follow the same rules as the rest of the game. And it's basically just because prior to them patching it out and figuring out a fix for it, if you got too far away from that X point, the procedural algorithms would just break down. And this apparently is the same core issue behind Starfield's issues. Um, and it's because of the creation engine. It's just a, a hold back to days of old and it limits what they can do. Now, for me, if I were designing a game and I realized that we couldn't actually do a whole like crazy elaborate procedurally generated map because of our engine, I would either be like, okay, we need to figure something else out or we need to get new tech. We need like different ideas, whatever. Like if this is going to be all we can do, we need to pivot. But to BGS, they heard all of these problems, all these limitations to the creation engine and what they could do with Starfield. And they chose to follow through on it anyways. And I think that that is a testament to potentially issues with the design where they seem to settle for underwhelming features, maybe? I don't know. They're willing to accept that this isn't gonna be as good as the competition, but at least it's something so we can kind of sell it as being extra cool. Why don't they just update it? Apparently it's very, very difficult to fix that problem with the floating points and, and or floats and with um, that sort of world instant spawn. It requires a ton of rewriting and apparently BGS just doesn't wanna do that. And this again, I mean, kind of goes back with this is the creation engine has a lot of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, a lot of people just point at the, the weaknesses, but they do have strengths such as, you know, the modding community, which as we all know, tends to fix a lot of BGS's games. And that's worth something, right? <laughs> Starfield's kind of the first time that the modding community has really not responded well to one of their games. And it's because there's a lot of core technical problems that make modding it very, very difficult. A lot of people were hoping that they'd be able to just mod an entire planet. And so you remember in the lead up to, to Starfield, a lot of people were like, I'm not worried that there's a thousand planets and a lot of them are gonna be empty because they're just gonna be able to fill those with like, oh, this, this planet is Hoth now. And this planet, I'm just going to create the whole Star Wars universe. There's like a mod pack that just adds in all the Star Wars planets. I'm going to go over here and, oh, it's the Dagobah system. And you can go meet a little Yoda at one of those planets. People were excited for that. But what they ended up getting was a series of tiny fish bowls stitched together into a shape resembling a planet. But it's just not, it's not what they were hoping for. It's not what they wanted. And so they ended up turning off a lot of their their modding community because the coolest idea for modding Starfield ended up being impossible or at least so prohibitively time consuming and overwhelming to do that it just didn't make sense. They're like, I'll just go back to modding Fallout or Skyrim or whatever. So the modding community is a benefit of it. The other thing Todd has said that the creation engine offers them to do is that he says that it's very, very fast. He said they're able to build environments very, very quickly. He also has said that they are very like familiar with it. They, they really know it and that's valuable because to switch engines would require tons of training and all sorts of headaches there. But, but like, again, it's just at what point do these, these pros not outweigh the cons because there's other things that are, are cons such as, uh, graphical shortcomings, right? Shortcomings. There are all sorts of things like bugs that they still have had to deal with, uh, performance issues. The creation engine does not run very well. Starfield ran better than pretty much any other Sky or, uh, Bethesda game I've played at launch, but still not saying much. And I was playing it on like a very hefty computer, which helped, but it still has plenty of issues. It's, it's far from perfect. Then, you know, there, there's just... What are some other positives? I'm trying to think of other positives for it. Uh, the modding community speed, they know it. I don't know. Uh, there are systems. Um, so they have systems for like AI for, for their simulations, things like that, that would be tough. I'm sure to rewrite and move over to a new engine, but still it would be doable. Um, as for the writing, this is a consistent thing I've heard there was one positive, I think, with Starfield, which was that they had a cool idea 
for New Game Plus. And that's the only positive I've heard. Everything else was like lazy quests, the uh, main quest for Starfield was just a fetch quest. The characters are pretty one-dimensional. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're, it's never been that compelling. It's never, it's never been that compelling. Creation Engine all, probably also deserves credit for the ability to maintain sense that this feels like a BGS game, positive or negative perhaps. But yeah, I, I guess you're right. It does have the, the Bethesda, uh, what Mr. Matty Plays called it was the Bethesda stank. <laughs> Is <laughs> what he called it. He's like, they just, they have a scent to them. You can sense it from a mile away. You see a screenshot and you're like, that's a Bethesda game, you know? Michael, thank you for the two. If CDPR changed, there's no reason Bethesda can't. Well, so this kind of leads us to the other thing. What, like, if we're looking at all of this, what is a reason for Bethesda to keep all of this? Like, I mean, let's also just say a positive. They own it. It's theirs. They don't have to pay for licensing. They don't have to pay for any extra tools. It saves time because again, moving over to a new engine would cost a lot of training time. They'd have to get the, all the teams figured out. Um, beyond that, like a lot of their current assets, a lot of things that they've built for previous games, they'd have to start from scratch in a, a new engine. So there's a lot of reasons for them to be like, eh, eh. So it's just kind of rough. Um, but I think that a lot of this kind of leads to situations where I think a lot of it would just end up being more positive than negative because there's an old saying it goes back to a, a political strategist in the 1980s where he said that uh, perception is reality and his whole idea with that very simple heuristic was that you should always evaluate perceptions as the reality such that you have to deal with those even if they aren't factually true. So in the context of politics, it was like, if everybody thinks that this political candidate is a, a liar or just compulsively lies, it doesn't matter if they actually are lying or not. It doesn't matter if you can demonstrate with like all the, the paper trails. No, they were telling the truth at every single thing they said. They've never told a lie. It doesn't matter. If everybody has the perception you're a liar, you have to deal with that. If you, in the context of politics, if you want it to be uh, successful because you're trying to convince people to vote for you. In the context of uh, any general market, the same principle holds true. If everybody believes that uh, yellow food coloring causes you to immediately acquire erectile dysfunction, if everybody believes that's the case, even if it is factually demonstrably not the case, you're gonna see companies removing yellow food coloring from their, their products because it's just not worth the trouble. Like. Why would they fight that? Why would they do like a whole education campaign when it's easier to just simply remove the coloring, right? And we've seen that craft, uh, craft mac and cheese. There was, um, I believe it was the food babe. She's like a really wealthy woman who's very bored <clears throat> and she's like a textbook chemo uh, has chemophobia. She's terrified of all things chemical. And so she petitioned to have Kraft mac and cheese remove a certain food coloring from their mac and cheese. And Kraft was like, okay, it's not worth the trouble. We'll just use a different one. <laughs> so they just removed it, right? And so it's all about dealing with the perception above and beyond the reality. The perception with Bethesda Game Studios is that they have a, an engine that's very broken, that's very outdated and can't compete with the competitors no matter what. They also have a problem with the writers where a lot of people feel like um, the current writing staff over at Bethesda is basically tenured and no longer has the spark or fire. They never did a particularly amazing job, but they're just kind of going through the motions now. And all of the, the concepts that they've come up with in the last decade have been pretty underwhelming. The one exception to that, I think Skyrim worked pretty well, but even with Skyrim, like it is a, a very, it's a very simplistic RPG, if you can even call it that. Like it's much more, I've called them sandbox games before. I've also called them junk food games. Cause it's kind of like popcorn. Like it might give you a little bit of taste, a little bit of something to work with, but it's not anything substantive. Like it's not going to actually change your, your, uh, you know, muscle mass or help you in any significant way. There's not a lot of nutrients there. It's just junk food. And that's kind of Skyrim. Like you think back to Skyrim and some of the missions and quests, like you show up to the, the magic college winter hold or whatever it's called. And you just walk in, you do like a couple missions. And in the span of like 45 minutes, you're now the head of the entire school. <laughs> and they're just like, yep, congratulations. 
There you go. And it's like when you're a toddler or a young kid and you're playing and you're just like, yes, and I now am king. And you put on the helmet or the, the helmet, the crown, like I am king now. Everybody's Isa like, Abdul he said Nur it. Donated five you know? Jordanian dinars through Super Chat. Thank you. Masochist here with 300 plus Starfield hours. I'm so sorry. It made me cherish games that outdo what it attempts, highlighting its lazy implementation on decent ideas. Yeah, I think the general perception is that Bethesda just, is just very lazy. And at this point, that's kind of the, the perception everybody has after this. So like if we break all of this down and if we just say, okay, we, um, we break that. If we go changing engines, okay, maybe UE5, maybe something else, who knows? They contact Gorilla, get access to, to Decimo, whatever, who knows? But, which now couldn't happen, let's just be clear, because they're owned by Xbox, but still. Um, whatever engine they go, probably, let's just be real, probably UE5, okay? Let's just be perfectly honest about that. The, the cost is a big problem. They're going from owning something to having to pay royalties basically on the, the next engine. That's that's a negative. That's something that's significant. Now that they're owned by Xbox, I think margins are less important, but still that's something to consider. Um, there's also added costs in the form of time. They have to train their staff. Um, they have to do you know, time to transition because there's all sorts of like assets that have to be changed over. They're going to have to probably completely rework their, their daily workflow. The producers are going to have to restructure how they do things. You know, are they going to be using some of the free assets? Are they going to be hiring outside companies to help develop assets? There's all sorts of things um, that have to be considered and, you know, thrown together like this. Other negatives, you know, the mods may be harder to implement. Okay, so that's that's something where the creation engine kit is something their modding community knows very, very well. So that could be a negative. What else? Other cons? I don't know. I'll, we'll, we'll come back to that if we think of any. Positives, graphical improvements immediately. I mean, it just huge, huge leap forward in terms of fidelity. You also would potentially see, I say potentially, because like we've seen plenty of, of UE games that are not stable, but there's the potential for stability increases. I still think the Unreal Engine 5 has better overall stability than the Creation Engine based on the things that I've seen and played. Um, it still can be done poorly. You can still have games that run poorly that are Unreal Engine games, but I still think it's probably better than Creation Engine. Uh, beyond that, I think you also, pro I, I mean, I, I would have to imagine that if BGS moved over, I think they'd have Epic's backing in the same way that, that CDPR seemingly has their backing. And I mean, this is the other thing with all of this, like CDPR did it. And the one thing everybody says is that CDPR is always cutting edge when it comes to graphics um, outside of the launch <laughs> window. But Cyberpunk 2077 was one of the most graphically impressive games of all time with the form of uh, the 2.0 update, um, even 1.4 was amazing, but the Phantom Liberty expansion when they had the full ray tracing stuff, it is an amazing set of technology. I mean, it's it's just a fascinating collection of different tools and proprietary stuff from NVIDIA. It's wild. And they chose to walk away from those tools and go to CDP or, or go to uh, Epic and use Unreal Engine 5. And that should tell you just how impressed they were with unreal engine you know it's, it, i mean that's a big deal that's huge that's huge so i think that that's something to consider as well uh mods would be easier in unreal engine 5 in my opinion since so many more people have knowledge of ue5 it's as close to industry standard as the game engine can get i mean that's also true that's also true. i mean the one reason i heard somebody at a gdc talk they said that they're uh, the reason they chose to use the Unreal Engine for their studio, it was like a smaller indie studio, was because when people leave college and after they've been trained in school, moving to a company that uses Unreal Engine is the easiest way to do it because they've all been training with Unreal Engine through school. So they're already familiar with it. Whereas if you're using a proprietary tool set, you have to learn that separately and it's a whole other thing, you know? So... That's that's something to consider. The other the other piece to this too is that the creation engine has a bad rep. It really does. 
I mean, you look at any trailer for Starfield from the moment it was announced. People said, oh God, they kept the creation engine. People are saying now for the Elder Scrolls 6, if they're keeping the creation engine, they're screwed. It just has a bad reputation. And as I said earlier, I think for this stuff, perception is reality. And I think if the perception is that the creation engine is holding them back a ton, they got to deal with that. That's what they got to deal with. So I think that that switching over, getting rid of creation engine shows flexibility. I think it shows that they are willing to grow and change, even if it means leaving behind a tool set that they've used for decades at this point. So I think that that's, that's certainly something to, uh, to consider. Um, and honestly, like this is perhaps the biggest reason to do it. I, I think the creation engine at this point is just anathema. Like people hear it and are just, ugh. they're just not loving it. There are pros, as I've said to the creation engine, there's reasons that Bethesda would want to keep it. There's reasons for it. There's also reasons that people really don't like it, that it's a negative, that it seems to hold them back. And I think the consistent thing we've seen with BGS is that there is a broader perception that they are unwilling to change and adapt to modern times and that they are falling further and further behind the competition. Because as we've seen these huge leaps forward, especially in terms of tech from Guerrilla Games, from CDPR, even from Ubisoft, some of the stuff they're able to do with their scalar tech is just crazy and mind blowing. But BGS is still making games that feel like they could be running on the, the PS4. The only thing about Starfield that feels next generation is that the load times are pretty fast. There's still thousands of them, but at least they're pretty fast, you know? If you have Epic's backing, which if Bethesda Game Studios, CD Projekt Red are doing deals with Epic, they're working with them to design tools. And this is what they said when they announced it. So they were saying very openly, yeah, we're gonna be working with Epic to design and basically make our very specific version of Unreal Engine that works for our types of games. Let's see if this is it. It's an open world game design with The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077 combining freedom of exploration with compelling storytelling in unparalleled fashion. Through a new partnership with Epic, CD Projekt Red is building a brand new Witcher saga with UE5. Our cooperation with Epic has just started. It was uh, the shift towards uh, open world support that brought Unreal Engine 5 to our attention. So there was one demo uh, that happened last year that was the medieval environment demo where at one point uh, there's a notice board that looks strangely familiar to things we've done in the past that has even a sign that says Monster Slayer Wanted. And I'm like, hmm, are they are they trying to tell us, you know, come come over to Unreal Engine, look how great your games can look on there? Is, was that was that whole demo made with that nefarious purpose? I don't know, but it definitely definitely caught my eye. This opens a new chapter for us, where we really want to see how our experience in building open world games gets combined with all the engineering power of Epic. One of the things that is really important to keep in mind when when talking about open world games versus let's say more linear games is the possibilities of the things that can go wrong or the, 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 the scenarios that you have to consider are exponentially higher than linear games. Players can go in whatever direction that they want. They can handle content in, in, in any order that they want, theoretically. And to really encapsulate that means that you need a really stable environment where you can be able to make changes with a high level of confidence that it's not going to break in 1,600 other places down the line. Unreal Engine is like a, a toolbox which has a lot of features a lot of solutions already there that allow teams to just try new stuff. The fact that Unreal is used by a lot of teams already in the world, a lot of perspectives are projected into the design of the tools, and that helps the tool to be way more agile. So all in all, it's a really, really cool technology to like prototype and make environments really quickly, really beautiful and very realistic. Epic and CD Projekt Red are the two companies that, that really want to achieve something great. We won't stop just, you know, by uh, developing some features. We, we won't stop there, yeah? We will continue to, to work together to achieve something extraordinary in the end. Continue to work together to achieve something, achieve something extraordinary in the end. He's the CTO. I mean, this is the guy that probably is directly responsible for CD Projekt moving over to Unreal Engine. I mean, he's the the guy that's deciding what tech they use and why they use it and how they use it. So he's the one that would uh, be making this big decision. 
And so if CDPR is looking at it and is saying, this makes a lot of sense, let's check it out. That's, I mean, that's, that should tell you something. That should really tell you something. Cause I think everybody agrees. And I mean, maybe we can find one person that, that doesn't. I think everybody kind of agrees that we probably have like the red engine. And people say that the red engine is probably above the creation engine, right? People are like, yeah, it's probably superior graphically, technologically. I mean, everything they were able to do in Cyberpunk was amazing. Witcher 3 was amazing. So red engine is probably better than that. But the fact that CDPR considered what UE5 was capable of to be superior to what they were able to do, or at least what they were reasonably able to do with the same resources and money and budgets and everything. What does that say about the creation engine? <laughs> I mean, if they're still holding back and refusing to, to consider going over, it's just crazy to me. So all of this to say, like, I think that there's pros and cons to each, to keeping it to changing engines, but I think that there's a lot more pros to, to partnering with Epic and choosing to move over. Maybe there are new licensing things. Maybe there's things behind the scenes that make this more complicated and not as simple. Maybe CDPR has a deal where it's like, yeah, you can't partner with any other huge company to share the tools we're making um, for the Witcher games. You can't share those with Bethesda or with anybody else that partners with you. Maybe that's it. Who knows? There's probably a lot of stuff behind the scenes that get factored into this, but I do still think that the creation engine is such an albatross around their necks. It's such a, a, a ball and chain holding them back that at this point, it's just not just for, for PR sake, not just because it has a really bad reputation, but also just because I think their tool sets have demonstrated for at this point, two full releases back to back that their tool set is just not capable of keeping up with their ideas. And at that point, Maybe look elsewhere. I brought this up a while back. I'm just worried all games will start to feel the same if everyone moves to Unreal Engine 5. I think that that's fair. I mean, a lot of games probably will start to get samey. And the, the prediction from a lot of people that are much smarter than me has been that we're probably going to see a good number of like indie games or double A games that look graphically phenomenal that end up being garbage, but they'll look amazing, right? And I, I think we, we haven't quite seen that yet, but I think we're going to see that in the next few years where we're going to see games where we're like, oh my God, this is an indie studios. What? This is an indie. What? It's going to blow your mind, but you're going to get the game and it's going to be like, okay, so it's basically just a really pretty walking simulator and that's about it. You know, I, I think we're going to see that type of thing a lot. So I, I do think there will be growing pains like that, but I also think that it's at the end of the day. I think the good games will still float to the top. Like they just generally do. Yeah, not all studios will switch. There's reasons to also consider other engines as well. It mainly depends on what kind of game you're looking to make, what your margins are. All of that stuff has to factor into this. It's not a, a one size fits all consideration. You know, there's some answers that make more sense than others based on what you're doing. Like if you're making a 2D game, it might not make sense to invest heavily into like the, or it's like a super linear 2D game. It might not make sense to invest super heavily into Unreal Engine for your team. It might make more sense to look at something like Unity. Um, same with like mobile games. I've heard mobile games very, very commonly built on Unity. So it's not a, a given for everybody that one engine is gonna be best for anybody, but still. He took my thing.